Dr. Marketing Tips, paging Dr. Marketing Tips. Dr. Marketing Tips, you're needed in the marketing department. Welcome to the Dr. Marketing Tips Podcast, your prescription to the answers you seek to grow your medical practice easier, better, and faster. This show is all about connecting practice administrators and medical marketing professionals with peers working in practices, learning from experiences, making mistakes, and sharing successes. Let's get started. Hey there, welcome to the Dr. Marketing Tips Podcast. This is Jennifer, and today we've got a real treat for you. We're going to continue our series about getting your practice on with the local media. So today we've got Keith Landry, our Director of Public Relations, and he's going to be joined by Matthew Petty, who happens to be the host of the Intersection Public Affairs Show and the news director at WMFE 90.7 FM in Orlando. So today you're going to tune in and really hear why owners and managers of medical care practices need to um, know how to connect with your local radio stations to get your messages out there. Keith is going to dive into what you need to know when it comes to getting yourself on the local media when you're opening maybe a new office location, adding a new physician, or maybe you're implementing some kind of new technology and you want to let your patients know what's going on out there. Now, the thing about Matthew Petty, today's guest, is that he offers a real news radio veteran's insight into how the industry has been transforming to move to more digital content. And he's going to tell you exactly what you need to know to get your medical practice more news coverage. I think you're going to be in for a real treat, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to Keith. Go ahead and get us started, Keith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Marketing Tips podcast. I'm the Director of Public Relations with Insight Marketing Group, Keith Landry. And today we're talking about connecting with your local radio station to get your message out. And we've got a wonderful expert today talking about that. Matthew Petty is the news director at WMFE 90.7 FM radio, which is NPR. And I want to thank you for being uh, on the podcast today, Matthew. Well, thanks for inviting me, Keith. It's good to be here. You bet. So you've been with WMFE radio since, uh, let's see, 2012, doing all kinds of interviews, covering all the news, and you've been the host of their intersection, public relations, or rather, um, uh, let's see, we'll call it the public affairs show. You've been doing that for about seven years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I, had, I wear numerous hats at WMFE. I mean, the nature of public radio is you tend to start doing one job and then you get pulled in a bunch of different directions. You end up doing a lot of different jobs and you know, we're a pretty small shop. So everybody has to do a lot of different things at, at one time it seems. But um, yeah, one of my jobs is hosting our public affairs show intersection, which is uh, on Thursdays at 12 noon and then repeating at 9 PM. And so we try and kind of take a look at some of the big stories in central Florida and um, sort of wrap our arms around them from a, a local perspective, um, not just uh, Orange County and, and Orlando here, but also, you know, Seminole County, uh, Volusia, um, out to the coast there, and, and all the way up as far as the villages as well. So we, we cover a bit of territory. Uh, we do what we can to sort of tell the stories that are important to Central Floridians, and we, we have a bit of audience interaction too. We'll, we'll sort of take calls from time to time and, and um, kind of hear from our audience that way too. So our podcast listeners are thinking, hmm, British accent, Australian accent, it's actually a New Zealand accent. Tell us about your experience covering radio down under. Sure. So um, New Zealand is where I got my start in journalism. Actually, I went to journalism school in Canada. I got a degree in journalism uh, from the University of Western Ontario at, in London, Ontario. They have a, a wonderful journalism program. They're a really good focus on broadcast journalism. Um, and I actually went into journalism school thinking, I want to be a writer. I want to write for newspapers because I've always kind of been in love with the written word, you know, the printed word. And a lot of my favorite journalism growing up and even now is, is like newspaper reporters, to be honest. And I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just as happy sitting down with a newspaper or a magazine and reading through that as I am watching a television broadcast or listening to the radio. But I kind of got seduced by broadcast along the way because there's something kind of fun about the creativity that goes into whether you're, 
you know, creating a TV package as you know, Keith yourself or, or making a, you know, a, a, um, a story on radio, like there's an element of drama that goes into that and being able to keep the listener or the viewer engaged in the story that goes beyond um, the printed words. So I sort of got interested in broadcast along the way. Um, I thought after journalism school, like I want to do television now, I want to be a television reporter. But my first job was in, in radio and I kind of fell in love with radio and I've been here ever since. And it's cool because you've got that unique accent that really makes you stand out. So that's just, oh, that's Matthew Petty. I know that voice anywhere. So that, that's really cool. Let's yeah, talk it's, a little it's bit. Unique. It's unique. It's sometimes a little confusing. People are like, where are you from? What did you say? Say that again. So it kind of cuts both ways. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our listeners are folks usually affiliated with medical practices, doctors, groups. What's your advice for them uh, trying to get their message out to their local radio station, be it NPR or even commercial? Just uh, from a public relations perspective, maybe they have a new doctor, a new technology, a new location. Uh, What are you looking for, Matthew, when somebody tries to get their message to you? Uh, I mean, we're looking for a good story, really. And I mean, to be honest, sometimes the stories that businesses want to tell aren't necessarily the stories that we want to report because we're not always trying to tell feel-good stories. Sometimes we're trying to, you know, reveal information that's useful to people, but it might not necessarily be something that a business wants to highlight or a business Mm -hmm. wants to promote. But, you know, there's always a way, I think, to tell your story in a way that's going to be engaging and is going to be appropriate for the audience that whatever the radio station or television station is that, that you're pitching the story to. Right. And, you know, the one thing I'll tell people um, when I talk to public relations experts is if you're sending me a pitch, keep it really short. I mean, I've got a bit of a backlog in my inbox at the moment. I think I have like <laughs> 1300 unread emails. Right. I've got to do a little bit of uh, yard work there and clear some of them out. But honestly, um, you know, if you, if you can get your listener or your reader hooked on the first line, then that's going to get them to read the rest of the email. It's the same principle we use when we're telling a story, right? I mean, we've got for a radio feature, um, like three and a half minutes to tell the story, which is kind of like an eternity <laughs> in, yeah, in broadcast, is. but it's not really that long. Or if it's a, a newscast spot, it's like 40 seconds you've got a very short amount of time to tell your story, but you've got to keep the listener engaged. Right. And it's the same for when you're, you're pitching a story. If you're a public relations person, you're like, I really want to get this story or this, this thing in front of um, some, some radio stations or television stations. Like you've got to make it engaging enough that, that whoever it is you're pitching the story to news director, reporter, whatever is going to want to read the entire thing. Like, so my, my advice would be just keep it short, figure out who your audience is. Like you have to know a little bit about um, the station that you're, pitching your story to I would say you know listen to that station a little bit and sort of figure out the kind of stories they do and decide whether whatever it is that that you're pitching to them is going to be a good fit yeah Um, and And I would say that I would say that our listeners that have an interest in medical groups and health that your particular radio station does have a health reporter. Abe Abariah has been assigned to yeah. those stories. Uh, what, what are the conversations you have with Abe about some of the pitches he sees? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the conversations we have, so Abe is a really good data reporter. So one of his strengths, and he has many actually, I mean, he's a very good um, investigative reporter too. Um, and he's done a lot of really great work on PTSD uh, among first responders. Um, and then we did a series last year where we looked into the TSA and some of the allegations of workplace, um, you know, abuse, et cetera, at the TSA in Orlando. But so, I mean, he's always looking to tell the human story, right? Like who does this affect? How does it affect them? But he's also really good at sort of taking the big picture and, and looking at, you know, what does the, what is the data telling us? We've got all these numbers, but what, what does that mean? And, and if you think about what's happening right now with COVID-19 and this pandemic and the way it's evolving, we're getting bombarded with numbers every day, right? But Mm -hmm. we need somebody to sort of sit back or stand back and and try and interpret those numbers and put them in context for us because otherwise they're, they're not going to be helpful at all. So we kind of see, you know, the reporting we do, and this is not just health reporting is we want to, we want to put information out there that's going to be useful to people. Right now, we're not telling you what to do with that information. We're just saying we want to make present this in a way that's going to help you understand it and then make decisions based on that. And that's kind of the, the principle that we 
we try to apply to all of our journalism. You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see, Matthew, moving forward. I think we might look back and say 2020 was the year when health news became critically important again. I mean, people have always cared about it, and broadcasters and print have always covered it. But I think there's a new emphasis on health moving forward. What do you think about that? And how does that, are, are you looking for more health stories now? Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, yeah, it's like, it's been a long time since the United States or, or basically anywhere in the world has faced a pandemic on, on the level of what we're seeing now. So I think every country, it's not just the United States, we're, we're sort of confronted with how good are our health systems what's working, what isn't working, and how do we, as reporters, how do we tell those stories? I mean, healthcare, as you know, in the US is it's a fiendishly complicated thing, right? It's, I don't think anyone really has all of the answers, and there's politics tangled up in it, there's technology, um, and then right in the middle of it, there, there are the, the doctors and the physicians and the frontline staff who are administering the care, and then the patients, right? And so, in amongst all of that massive complexity, you can't lose sight of those stories. And, and, you know, one thing we're trying to do, especially when we look at um, the pandemic and how we're covering it is like, how do we sort of tell, humanize the story, humanize those numbers. And I think going forward, um, yeah, definitely 2020 healthcare is, is a big thing and, and people are sort of rethinking that it could be a seismic shift. Who knows? We'll see, I guess. Um, but it's, it's, it's critical and I think it just remains to be seen what kind of changes come out of it and, and how we move forward from here. Hey guys, Corey here, co-host of the Dr. Marketing Tips podcast. And I wanted to interrupt this episode just for a minute to tell you about Insight Training Solutions. So Insight Training Solutions is an ongoing employee engagement and training platform for your medical practice, meaning employees can log on and take these medical practice specific trainings whenever and wherever they are. And each training is meant to increase employee engagement, improve practice reputation, and develop some patient service mindsets. If we're being honest, something that we all know some of the employees may lack, not uh, calling anybody out by name, but uh, one of the cool things about Insight Training Solutions is they're always developing new content and they just released 10 steps to a phenomenal patient experience where you'll learn how to create a phenomenal patient experience, strengthen job security, and discover customer service secrets for your entire team. So this course is in addition to the other ones they already have, which include communication across generations and how to understand today's multi-generational workforce and how to develop overall patient experience. This is another course, the new approach to customer service. We've also got eight ways to wow patients and you can sign up for a free trial to see what everything is about. Uh, at InsightTrainingSolutions.io. That's InsightTrainingSolutions.io or just Google Insight Training Solutions. You'll be glad you did. Now, for people who aren't familiar with my background, I was a TV news anchor for 26 years and I hosted a public affairs show for nine years. And the reason why I bring that up is because, Matthew, you've been hosting the Intersection program for about seven years. And yep. so you and I have been on the receiving end of news pitches for a long time. What are you looking for in a pitch from, uh, say, a medical practice or a medical group? They've got a new robotic procedure. They've got a new uh, doctor. They've got a new office that is going to be more convenient for people. If you get a pitch from a doctor's group or somebody trying to pitch themselves as a guest on your show for health, What's your advice to them on that? I mean, one thing you can look at is how does whatever the story they're pitching fit in with sort of the larger context of what's happening? Like, I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, we have a new robotic technology going on, but if you can sort of tie that to some of the latest trends, like, and, and make it about more than just the individual practice or the individual thing that you're, you're talking about, because, you know, there has to be something in it, I think, for, for the audience that goes mm -hmm. beyond um, just talking about that one particular business, right? I mean, and as you know, as a, as a former television reporter yourself, like sometimes you're, you're just looking for a story that's kind of quirky and interesting in and of itself, right? But sometimes, a lot of the time, you need something a little more than that. You've, you've got to 
you know, we, we're not just telling a story about, look at this cool new thing. It's like, why, you know, what does this tell you about trends? What is, what is, is this telling us about the way healthcare is going? So from the point of view of the person who's trying to get your story in front of some reporters or get it on the air, you've got to, you've got to try and be able to tie it into some of those bigger trends and give it a little more context. And I think that might increase your, your, uh, your level of success in terms of getting your, your stories on the air. And I think you make a great point because when I coach our clients, I'm always sort of coaching them to think broad, broad casting, widest public audience. What's in it for the listener, the viewer, the reader? How do we get a story that is broad, broad appeal to somebody who may not have expertise in the specialty that you offer in the medical world? Yeah, sure. And, and I mean, there's a whole language that goes along with medicine, right? It's like any specialty field, like there's a lingo and there's some jargon. And for somebody who's not familiar with that, it can be a little hard to understand. I mean, they talk about doctors having bedside manner, right? And that's the ability to be able to take a complex thing, a procedure and break it down and make it understandable to somebody who hasn't gone through, you know, four years of medical school and then another sort of three, four years of training after that. Like, you've got to be able to tell the patient what's going on. And in some ways, you know, this is the same sort of thing we're doing in the, in the world of, of media, right? We're taking these complex issues and trying to make them understandable for people so that they can sort of use that information for whatever purposes they want. But um, I think that's sort of part of the, the process you've got to take. If you can take something that's maybe super complicated and sort of break it down and make it simple and tell people why they should be interested, then, your chances of success are going to increase dramatically. That's great advice there. Let's talk about how the broadcast and print industries are changing and the context into which people are trying to get their messages out. So television uh, condensing, radio clearly condensing, newspapers clearly condensing. A lot more, especially on radio, there's been so much more automation over the last decade. So how are you guys operating, doing your jobs to do more stories, more content, potentially with uh, smaller staff or limited resources? Give us some insights on uh, how you guys are operating. Sure. I mean, you know, one thing that's changed, obviously, in the last couple of months is we've kind of become a distributed newsroom. So everybody's working out of their home offices. And um, for a good while, we would we were trying to avoid doing face-to-face interviews, except where we knew we could sort of make it safe, right? Sort of thinking about some of those social distancing elements that we were told are necessary to, to preserve, you know, health and safety. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, to a certain degree, we're still doing that. We haven't completely, you know, now we're, we're in the middle of June, we haven't completely moved back into the office yet. So we've taken some of those things like doing remote interviews. We're, we're all familiar with Zoom now, right? I mean, a few months ago, we'd be using this occasionally, but now it's like Zoom conferences every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the audio actually is pretty good from a radio point of view. Like the, the sound quality isn't too bad. It's kind of on par with telephone. So it's, it's usually good enough for broadcast, if not, um, you know, little newscast items and sometimes longer interviews. Um, in terms of like the condensing of, of the media business, I think you're really seeing that more in the print I mean, even in the last few months, like um, from March onwards, uh, and this is particularly tied to the economic impacts of the pandemic, right? Like a lot of big newspapers have had to either furlough or lay off a lot of staff or offer buyouts to their, their more highly paid senior staff. And that's not good for the, the media industry on the whole, because, you know, one thing about being a reporter and reporting on a community is the longer you spend there, the better you get at it, right? I mean, and, and Keith, you know this as much as anyone, like spending a long time in a community, you develop those connections. You kind of know where the stories are going to go. You have relationships with people that allows you to tell the story in a deeper way. And if you lose those reporters, then the whole sort of media landscape is poor for it. Now, one of the things that, you know, the, the benefits of public radio in central Florida, and, and in fact, anywhere in the country is we have a good network, right? So we, it's not just WMFE. We also partner up with, um, WUSF in Tampa. Uh, in fact, in the last couple of months, we've had a, a partnership going where we're working on a Facebook live show that we do once a week. Uh, we're partnering up with them to report on the election. And, and we have this ability to sort of tap into this network of public radio stations all across the state of Florida 
and tell some of those stories and sort of, you know, leverage that, that strength in numbers that we wouldn't be able to do if it was just us with our new team of, of seven people here in central Florida. So there is that. Um, the other thing I think you're seeing too is there's, there's kind of a lot of porousness between the different media, right? Like the Orlando Sentinel is not just a newspaper anymore. And this has been the case for a while, but their reporters are out doing podcasts. They've, they've got a, a kind of a, a live broadcast they do uh, on a daily basis to sort of a panel show. Um, so in some ways, when you, you know, start your career as a journalist, you're not necessarily just going to be a print reporter anymore. You've kind mm-hmm. of got to, everybody has to be a multimedia reporter. So you have to be able to be flexible and sort of be able to play in a lot of different spheres at once. Matthew, that's a great point. I mean, it is all about multimedia moving forward and digital media and getting on all the different platforms. I guess that raises the question of how are you guys using social media in your reporting and how has that changed over maybe the last five years? And if I'm running a medical practice, how can I sort of tap into that to try to get my ideas or my message onto your platforms? Or does that only happen after you cover a story? Um, That's a good question. I mean, the thing about social media I've found is every social media platform has its own unique sort of set of circumstances. I mean, I'm, I use Twitter a lot and I find Twitter is really good. It's, it's almost a, it's kind of custom built for reporters in some ways, right? Because if I'm out covering an event, I'll be live tweeting it. And I sort of use that as my reporter's notebook. I'll go back and look at what I was tweeting about to sort of cross reference it with, you know, audio that I've recorded at the time or, or pictures I might've taken. Um, but not everybody uses Twitter, right? I mean, Facebook has has a lot more users than, than Twitter. Um, and so when we're out, you know, doing a story, we'll, we'll sort of link it on Facebook in terms of how we promote our, um, our shows we do, whether it's the Facebook Live show on Tuesdays or Intersection on Thursdays. We'll put questions out on, on Facebook uh, and try and generate some responses that way. We've experimented with... Um, with live broadcasting uh, a radio show on Facebook at the same time. So we sort of have like a multi-platform thing going um, from a company's point of view, as far as sort of using social media to, to, you know, get your stories in front of people. Of course we are as journalists looking on, on social media all the time for story ideas. Like I'm looking on Twitter, I'm looking on Facebook, um, you know, Instagram, whatever the medium may be to try and get story ideas. So just being, present on those platforms is going to help you. The other thing about social media is you, you have to, I mean, you have to sort of approach it, I think with a certain amount of care and be monitoring it. It's not enough just to put a tweet out there or drop a message on Facebook and just leave it for a day. You've got to keep up with it because if people are asking you about it and, and trying to get some interaction and nothing's happening, it's going to make it look like whoever's in charge of that Facebook page or that Twitter feed is asleep at the switch. And that's not a good look, right? That's and it can get you in trouble too. <laughs> so, you know, there've been numerous cases of um, companies posting something on Twitter or Facebook and thinking it seemed like a good idea at the time and it's, and, and it gets blown up and it blows back and then yeah, bad things can happen. So you've <laughs> got to be pretty careful about it and you've got to keep your eye on the ball. Wow, that is fantastic advice right there. One other thing I want to make sure I squeeze into our time here today is if a medical practice or doctor's group wants to look at sponsorship with NPR, because I remember having a meeting maybe three years ago or so with one of your salespeople at that time. I remember leaving that meeting struck by how great your demographic is from a perspective of advertising. It's a very um, affluent demographic, you might say. So, I mean, I, I don't really have anything to do with the, the sponsorship of things. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a firewall between the newsroom and um, sponsorship. We, we work with a, um, a company called Market Ingenuity and they're, they're a fantastic team of, of um, you know, uh, experts in underwriting, we call it underwriting rather than advertising, but they're great at getting out and securing, you know, sponsorship from people who are a good fit for our listeners. Um, I mean, it, it never hurts to kind of send a pitch to, <laughs> to, to WMFE, but it, it wouldn't be to me personally, it would be to our, 
the folks that we have at, at Market Ingenuity. But I mean, you're right. I mean, it, I think, again, it comes down to knowing the audience, sort of knowing who you want to get your message out in front of and, and doing a bit of research on who the listeners are for a station, whether it's WMFE or anyone else before you decide, yep, this is the, this is the person I want to pitch my, uh, my sale to. Good deal. Matthew, I hear the landscapers coming, so I'm going to move this toward a close. <laughs> Give us one last insight you want to share um, regarding connecting with your local radio station. Um, well, I mean, as a reporter and as the news director, I get bombarded with pictures, right? And I don't always have time to respond to every single email I get or a call I get, but I would say just be persistent. Like there's no harm. And if you get turned down, doesn't mean like the next story you pitch isn't going to be a good one. So I think for a PR person sort of pitching stories, you've got to have a bit of, bit of a thick skin and you've got to just kind of keep pitching stories in the, in the hopes that one day one of them will stick. So I would say just be persistent about it. Yeah. I think it's about a, based on 10 years of being a public relations consultant, I think it's about a 33 percent sticking rate we'll call it that sounds pretty good actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right well matthew petty the news director of wmfe 90.7 fm radio npr and the host of intersection thank you so much for your time today and your insights and helping our listeners get some insights on connecting with their local radio stations it's a pleasure to speak with you again thanks keith appreciate it Thanks for listening to the DrMarketingTips.com podcast. If there's anything from today's show you want to learn more about, check out DrMarketingTips.com for our podcast resource center with all the notes, links, and goodies we mentioned during the show. If you're not already a subscriber to our show, please consider pressing the subscribe button on your podcast player so you never miss one of our future episodes. And if you haven't given us a rating or review yet on iTunes, please find a spare minute and help us reach and educate even more of our medical practice peers. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Doctor's Orders.